Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing this study in the book of Proverbs, and I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, chapter 28, beginning with verse 20. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on Proverbs, uh, they're all uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. But for now, let me just pick up where I left off. And I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it in the KJV first. And I may have to look at it in the amplified version. Sometimes I find that to be helpful. Verse 20, chapter 28, says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, if you try to get rich quickly, instead of just your diligence, good planning, uh, persistence, making one wise decision on another, uh, that's the... That's the get rich slow plan. The get rich slow plan is you can keep your integrity. You can have certainty that you're going to gain wealth over the period of 20 years. But when you're trying to get rich quickly, suddenly, uh, many times, it's because you've taken a lot of shortcuts. Maybe lies were told. There was uh, fraud committed. There was uh, dishonesty people were taken advantage of. These are the kinds of things that happen when people are tempted to get rich quickly. So this says here that um, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. Be, be faithful. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to your family. Be faithful to friends. Be faithful to society. Be honest. And you will be blessed. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. In other words, if you get rich quickly, there's uh, it's highly likely that you're not innocent. You are violating something, either either the laws of God or the laws of men. What it, how is it phrased in the Amplified? It says, a faithful, right-minded man will abound with blessings, but he who hurries to be rich will not go unpunished. Well, you can be punished in a lot of ways. One way you get punished is because you're by hurrying, you make mistakes and you fail and you suffer great losses. And if you do succeed in getting rich quickly, uh, then perhaps you've taken shortcuts, as I said, through dishonesty, stealing, uh, and uh, getting rich at other people's expense. And it said you will be punished. Let's go to verse 21. And the KJV says, To have respect of persons is not good, for a piece of bread that man will transgress. Well, I better read that in the Amplified before I comment. Maybe it'll help me. To have regard for one person over another. And to show favoritism is not good. Well, the scripture says God is not a respecter of persons. And it's saying to us, don't be a respecter of persons. Don't show favoritism for, for favoring one person over another. Be fair to everyone. It says, because for a piece of bread, a man will transgress. All right, let's go to verse 22. In the KJV says, he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that, that poverty shall come upon him. This is the same point that was made uh, two verses ago, is that when you try to get rich quickly, uh, it's not the wise approach to take. There's um, almost certain riches and wealth and success for the person who plans well, uh, applies wisdom to their judgments, their decisions uh, in terms of uh, business dealings, 
uh, and if they're diligent and even when mistakes are made, they bounce back and persist. And that kind of a person is certain to succeed, but they must also have patience. It's get rich slow will be guaranteed to that diligent person. But when you try to get rich fast, as it says here, says he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye in other words it's not the right approach it's not wise you'll be tempted to do evil things lie cheat steal in order to get rich and consider it not that poverty shall come upon him so you're probably going to really make some big mistakes and be in poverty because of those mistakes because you rushed into things and maybe you'll be in poverty in prison because you violated laws to get ahead uh, verse 23 in the kjv says he that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue well flattereth with the tongue is and, and the way it's used here is to compliment people, not because you have a sincere uh, statement to be made, but you're you're just trying to um, get an effect from them. To, uh, through compliments and flattery, you're hoping that they will favor you somehow and you can maybe gain something. That's flattery in the negative sense. Now, there is nothing wrong with flattering people. If you, uh, uh, if you have something nice to say about someone to them that will bless them, and you're not doing it in order to gain something in return, then by all means, flatter people and bless them with, with encouragement, kind words, try to uplift them. But if your your motivation is to just tell them anything, just to compliment them, to try to and get something in return, that would be flattery in in a negative sense. So let me read it again. It says, "He that rebuketh a man, okay, so rebuking someone is to correct them, to tell them, look, you're wrong on this, and this is why." And we have to rebuke people. I sometimes get rebuked by people. And uh, rebuking people, if you do it the right way, is the right thing to do. Uh, we're, we've given a protocol in order to do it as, as Christians. You know, first we talk to uh, a believer privately. Uh, we don't try to embarrass them publicly. Uh, and and we, we talk to them privately. Tell them where I think you're wrong on this, and this is serious because because of this, and you try to persuade them. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work, and they they do not change their mind, and maybe it's necessary to bring other people along to support you and say, look, uh, it's not just me that sees this. It's here are our friends, and we're all in agreement that you're wrong, and and you need to make a correction here. Uh, that kind of rebuke is a good thing to do. Uh, but it says, uh, you shall find favor if you do that, particularly if you're rebuking someone that is wise, because a wise person wants to be corrected. There's a saying that um, only, only a fool will hold on to the errors once they've been exposed. If I'm wrong about something, I want to be told. And if and, and if you persuade me I'm wrong, I'm not going to keep on maintaining the uh, the error. I'll be thankful that I don't. Oh, uh, thank you for correcting me. Now I can see the light and and I see where I was wrong. And I don't want to. I don't want to uh, think incorrectly. I certainly don't want to teach incorrectly. But. When you rebuke someone, how they react to it depends upon their maturity. A wise person will want to be corrected. Foolish people don't like to be corrected. Uh, let me read that in the Amplified and see how it phrases it. 
verse 23 says, he who appropriately reprimands a wise man will afterward find more favor. We'll see, see, this is these words here, appropriately and wise, uh, are inserted <clears throat> in the Amplified. The thing about the Amplified that can be helpful to us all, at least I find it helpful, is that it amplifies the scriptures. It not only translates it into a modern English, uh, but it also amplifies it, which means it expounds upon it. It's like a commentary right built right into the verse. And what I'm doing as I'm reading these verses and discussing it here now, I am amplifying the translation in my own way, in my own words. So the the publishers, the the translators, the commentators who did the amplified translation are doing nothing it's nothing different than what I'm doing, except they wrote it down and they inserted their viewpoint into the scriptures to try to help us understand how they see it. Now, you don't necessarily have to accept every every insertion and all of the, th the ways that they've amplified it. But for me, I like to read it because it, it sometimes is helpful. Sometimes I think, well, I think their, their uh, insertion there is seriously wrong. But I'm not afraid to look at it, and I think it sometimes can be helpful. But in this case, they inserted the words, he who appropriately reprimands. That's what I was talking about. If you want to rebuke someone, there's a proper way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. You don't do, embarrass people publicly like that. You talk to them privately. And it says, he who appropriately reprimands a wise man. Now, it inserted wise because, just as I said, if they're wise, they're going to be happy to be corrected. But if they're a fool, they're not going to like to be corrected. And it's going to be a, a big, big problem between the two of you. It says, he who appropriately reprimands a wise man will afterwards find more favor than he who flatters with the tongue. Flattering people, uh, yeah, that might uh, fool some people temporarily. But eventually, if you're guilty of flattery, you know people will begin to understand your your method, and 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 you will no longer have credibility. Uh, flattering people is is really being dishonest if you're doing it without sincerity. Now, any chance you have to compliment someone, you should, because why not? Why not tell somebody they're good at something or that they they uh, you like something about them? I think we should go out of our way to do that, but not with a secret motive to try to uh, gain something from them. Now, verse 24 in the KJV says, Whoso robbeth his father or his mother and saith, It is no transgression. The same is the companion of a destroyer. Who would steal from their father or mother? Do you know anybody? Maybe you've done it. Um, I can say of all the things I've done in my life, that's one thing I've not done. Um, yeah, I, it, it seems like a, a real low down thing to do, to steal from your own parents, to steal from anyone. But it seems to be even worse thinking that you would steal from your own parents. And yet, uh, I know some people who have done it. And usually it's because they are drug addict, uh, addicts. See, when you get addicted to drugs, there is uh, nothing too low for you. You will do anything. You will rob your own family, if necessary, to satisfy that drug addiction. So I've, I know people who have done that. It's a very low down thing to do. And it says, again, whoso robbeth his father or his mother and saith, it is no transgression, the same as the companion of a destroyer. Now in the Amplified, it phrases it this way. He who robs his father or his mother and says, this is no sin, is not only a thief, but also the companion of a man who destroys. Well, the companion of a man who destroys is, I, I think it's just a, a uh, like a poetic way of saying that uh, it, it it's destructive. I mean, imagine what it does to your relationship. I mean, some parents 
would be quick to forgive their son, their, their child that robbed them. Uh, some of them, parents would probably disown them, not want to have anything to do with them. Some parents are have so much love for their children that they, they let their children do horrible things and, and there's no consequences. Maybe that's why the child turned out to be a robber in the first place, because as the child grew up, maybe the parents spared the rod. There was no discipline in the family. And then that child was spoiled and they grew up to be a drug addict and a, and a robber. And uh, who knows what else happens if a child grows up without discipline, without understanding there are rules in life, there are laws, there are consequences for breaking them. Now let's go back to the KJV and look at the verse 25. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Made fat just means that you your needs will be provided. Uh, you will you'll have shelter. You'll have food. You'll have plenty. You won't be lacking. You, uh, you won't be in poverty uh, if you put your trust in the Lord. If you put your trust in the Lord, uh, the Lord's going to guide you, and you will study the scriptures. You'll gain wisdom. You'll do wise things. You'll you'll build up a successful life. Uh, but if your trust and your focus is not in the Lord, it's very easy to get way off track, track and fail. And it says, he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. A proud heart. Well, pride, I, I think pride was... The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. But from my studies, the scriptures taught me that pride is really the beginning of evil. Uh, Satan's fall was based upon pride. Adam and Eve's fall was based upon pride. They were told that, well, I know God told you that if you eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, that you'll die. But do you really believe God? No, the truth is you won't die, but you'll be like God. You'll understand right and wrong. You can make your own decisions. So they, pride made them think, I can be like God. I can make my own decisions. So pride says, and he in, in a previous chapter in Proverbs, maybe in this chapter earlier, it said, pride cometh before the fall. Pride is, is I think it is the origin of, of sin. And I think that pride is what prevents people from getting saved. For a person to, Call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Say, Jesus, I need you. Be my Savior. I, I'm, I need you to do it. You have to be humble. But if you're full of pride, you say, I don't need Jesus. I'm a pretty good person on my own. Why do I need Jesus? That's pride. So pride is, uh, is, is really, I think, the root of all men's problems. It says, uh, he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Let me read that in the Amplify. It says, an arrogant and greedy man stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be blessed and prosper. Okay, let's go back to the KJV for verse 26. It says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely he shall be delivered. <laughs> I've used this verse here uh, when I've gotten in conversations with Mormons. Because see, a, a, a Mormon, they believe the Book of Mormon is, uh, is also the Word of God. Matter of fact, they believe it is supersedes it. Uh, it, it is more perfect, more pure, and, and what we, they need to look at rather than the Bible. They put places above the Bible. Some of them might argue with that, but if you study their doctrines, you'll see the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants, Journals and Discourses, those writings, they believe that rather than what the Bible says. So this uh, Book of Mormon, is it true? Well, ask a Mormon now, you know, say, well, I, I don't believe it's true. And they said, well, all you've got to do is, is just 
pray and say, 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 Lord, if it's true, reveal it to me. Uh, and, and if you get a burning in your bosom, then that's the sign God will give you that you can trust it. The Book of Mormon is true. So they, they want a burning in the bosom. They want uh, this, uh, this heartfelt feeling to come to them that the Book of Mormon is true. If they get that feeling, then they believe, well, it must be true. But I've said, so you want me to, you want me to trust my heart. That's why you, why you believe the Book of Mormon, because you trust your heart, right? You f feel it in your heart. And uh, that's how I should make the decision, right? Well, the Bible says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Most Mormons are not familiar with that verse because they think they can trust their heart. Mr. Mrs. Mormon, did you know the Bible says the heart of man is deceitful above all things? Deceitful. Your heart will deceive you. You can't trust your heart. And it says right here in Proverbs, it says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. So I would say to all Mormons, you're trusting your heart? Then you are a fool because your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If you want to know if the Book of Mormon is true, then all you've got to do is study. I've got a playlist called Mormonism Debunked. There's, there's a, a ton of proof in it, that a mountain of evidence proving the Book of Mormon is not true at all. It's not historically correct. It's not archaeologically correct. It's not scientifically correct. And it doesn't even agree with the Bible. So if you want to decide whether the Book of Mormon is true or not, then you... Uh, you need to test it by the Bible, not by your heart. So if you're Mormon watching this, please go to my playlist, Mormonism Debunked, and you'll see that you've been told a lie probably since you were a young child. Most Mormons are Mormons from birth. They're raised in Mormon families. Let me read that verse in the Amplified and see how it phrases it. It says... Uh, he who trusts confidently in his own heart is a dull, thick-headed fool. But he who walks in skillfully, skillful and godly wisdom will be rescued. Okay. Now, verse 27 in the KJV says, He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Wow. Well, I've done that before. I, I, I remember the first time I read this verse about hiding your eyes. It really it struck me. It, it, it hit me deep inside, convicted me many times that I'll be in my car and a, a, a poor person would have a sign and they walk up towards you and you, you look away. You don't make eye contact. Will you look at the way? From the poor um, we need to we need to be sensitive to other people in need now some people think that they're really really good people they say well i follow the commandments i follow the golden rule i'm a good person some people even say sin no i don't i don't sin anymore i repented of my sin i don't sin anymore but what they do, they're doing is they're watering down the definition of sin. Sin is not simply committing a bad act. Like if you go up and just get violent with someone, you're committing a bad act. Uh, a sin, it, it, Jesus said, is even having a bad thought. If you hate someone, it's as though you murder them, you were violent with them. So even, not even a bad act, but even a bad thought is sin. But here's something that you better keep in mind, too. Negligence, failure to do a good deed when you have the opportunity is also a sin. And that's what this verse is talking about here. It says, He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack. So 
do good deeds. God will reward you back. It's not should not be your motivation, but it's the icing on the cake. You feel good because you help someone. And maybe you, in that way, you can witness to them too. Maybe they'll say, want to have a talk to you. Maybe you can tell them about Jesus. But if you give to the poor, you will not lack, it says. But he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Don't turn your eyes away from the poor. And then, let me see how that phrases it in the Amplified. He who gives to the poor will never want, but he who shuts his eyes from their need will have many curses. Let's go to verse 28 in the... Uh, in the KJV, it says, when the wicked rise, men hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. Yeah. yeah. In the Amplified, see how it phrases it. When the wicked rise to power, men hide themselves, but when the wicked perish, the consistently righteous increase and become great. Well, that's something maybe you may not have control over, whether which men are in power in government, in kingdoms. Uh, maybe you don't have any power over that. It's your, it's your a victim of your birth and your place in the world, the time in history, the place you were born, you have to live there. And uh, so uh, hopefully then you, you don't have to be born in a place where you have wicked men in power. Um, all right, that's the end of chapter 28. And I think because I'm here by myself tonight, I'm actually happy that I was able to get through this even for a half an hour because I've been very, very tired and worn out. Some of the medication I'm taking is making me very tired. I made a video before I started this one. It was a two minute video and it kind of got me fired up and it was maybe you'll watch that after this. But it says. Uh, the mark of the beast question mark. It's only two minutes long, but when I made the video, it got me real fired up. So I kind of got my adrenaline going for this study. But I think this is a good place to stop for tonight. Uh, I do want to tell you the good news. It only takes a couple of minutes to tell you the good news. Uh, the good news is, uh, is what the word gospel means. Gospel's Greek for good news. The good news is that Jesus loves you so much that even though we're sinners, he died for our sins. The Bible says, God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loves you that much. He died for you, he died for me. He paid for our sins and he offers eternal life in heaven to all of us as a free gift. That's right. And most people though, they don't understand the gospel. They're not even familiar with it. And, but if you study the Bible, this is what the Bible says. Uh, however, your typical person in the world today, even most people who are attending churches all around the world today, they don't understand the good news that salvation, eternal life in heaven is offered to all of us as a free gift from Jesus. They think that in order to go to heaven, that it's something we have to work for and we have to earn. They believe in the merit system. Uh, if you really try to abstain from sin and you get busy doing a lot of good things and, and then you die and you get judged, God will put your good deeds and your bad deeds on a scale. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad, it tilts in your favor and you say, okay, you're good enough, go to heaven. Oh, you're not good enough, you go to hell. That's how people see it. That most, all the religions of the world are based upon this merit system. Uh, a person goes to heaven based upon their own righteousness. If they're good enough, they go to heaven. If they're not good enough, they go to hell. But that is a lie from the devil. The Bible tells us that uh, uh, if you are trying to establish your own righteousness, it's impossible to be righteous enough, to be good enough to satisfy God's requirement. The standard God requires is perfection. Think of heaven as a as a sin free zone and so you're knocking on the gates and you want to get into heaven and but you see there's a sign above the gate it says no sin allowed and you think well have i ever sinned yeah we've all sinned 
The Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, I know that some people have sinned a lot more than others, but it's not the number of sin. And some, some people have all these different varieties of sins. We all have our different types of sins, but it's not the type of sin. The sign says no sin allowed. If you've sinned at all, you're excluded. You can't get in. That's why Jesus died for our sins. He paid for our sins. But if you try to get on a, to heaven on your own righteousness, it, it's impossible. But if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, it is possible. That's why Jesus' apostle said, well, Lord, from what you've been telling us, how is it possible for anyone to be saved if, if they got to be so good? And Jesus said, well, man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So don't try to get to heaven through your own efforts. Accept defeat. And realize you could never be perfect before God. And instead, call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Say, Jesus, I need you to be my savior. So Jesus is God Almighty, and he became a man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in order to die. And he died for our sins on that cross. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, and that bodily resurrection is the sign that Jesus promised us to prove his claims were true. He claimed he's God. He claimed he's the Savior. He claimed he has the power over life and death. Do you believe him? Believe in Jesus. Believe in his ability to save you. Believe in his faithfulness to keep his promise. He promises eternal life in heaven to everyone who trusts him. Do you believe he's trustworthy? Do you believe he's able? Put your confidence in him. And you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. And it's a free gift he offers you. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. Jesus bought it for you with his blood and with his suffering and his death on the cross. And he loves you so much. He's given it to you freely if you just trust him. But trusting Jesus, believing in Jesus, depending on him, means you're not believing in anything else. No longer believe in your own ability. No longer believe in the religions that you practice. Instead, believe in Jesus. Trust him completely. Please put your faith in him now. And then join me nightly for these live broadcasts, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.